Good afternoon. We will continue our studies in the Gospel of St. John. Today, finishing up chapter 11 and going partially, <clears throat> excuse me, partially into chapter 12. So we'll begin with John chapter 11, verse 55. I've titled today's message, The Heart of the Matter. So today I'm going to do something uh, somewhat new and actually comment on verses from two different chapters consecutively as the events appear to be occurring in a fairly, fairly similar uh, time frame. Uh, we're going to begin with verse 55 in John chapter 11 and move on from there to the first 11 verses of John chapter 12. So beginning in John chapter 11 with verse 55. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he, meaning Jesus, if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. John 12, beginning with verse 1. Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was that ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone, so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you will always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, Many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. And thus ends the reading of God's word. So this starts off back in Jerusalem. Yet simultaneously outside of Jerusalem in John 12 verse 1 to 11, we have something else going on. Jesus is back in Bethany. and implies that after raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus had left Bethany and went somewhere. Well, where did he go? Well, the previous chapter said out in the wilderness in a city called Ephraim. Some Bible scholars suggest he'd been celebrating another feast and was also sending out the 70 disciples. Others that he'd been in Samaria and had angered the Samaritans because he was going back to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And of course, that was according to the law of Moses, right? Well, of course, that begs the question, which Passover? Some scholars say only three while others say there were four Passovers that John deals with. I kind of go with the three, but that's a whole other sermon that will take us away from the main theme of my message today. But now Jesus is back on the scene six days before the Passover feast when people are prepping for it. In other words, they're going through the purification rites, and again, that's according to the law of Moses. He is once again at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. But others are there also to see Jesus. No, they want to see the dead guy. They want to see the guy that Jesus raised from the dead. They want to see if the story is true, right? Jesus has almost become ancillary to the fact of what had happened some time prior. Um, how long prior to that very day? We don't know. Days, weeks, maybe a month. Again, we don't know. Scripture is silent. We are told that Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, has just anointed him with spikenard, 
which is an unusual perfume that came all the way from India. All the way from India was used to anoint the dead as they were wrapped up and put into a sepulcher. Judas Iscariot is aghast and blurts out that it was a waste of money and that could have been sold for cash and the money given to the poor. What is of interest is what Jesus said to Judas and all those in attendance. Verse 7, Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Not to beat on the translators too difficulty, but once again, if we go to the Greek, it reads slightly different. The Greek notes that she had intended to keep it for the day. Well, for what day? Day of his burial. This, of course, raises some interesting questions. Did Mary know that Jesus was going to die? It appears so. One would assume so, or else why do it? And remember, this is not Mary Magdalene, the repentant prostitute, okay? What prompted Mary, sister to Martha and Lazarus, to pour out the spike nard on his feet now? Scripture is silent as to what's going on in Mary's mind, but we can gather from the previous glimpses of Mary that St. John gives us that Mary was truly a disciple of Christ. And by disciple, we mean a seeker, a follower. Okay? John tells us that she was always listening closely to what Jesus had to say. Whereas even the disciples were, at times, somewhat dull-witted, right? Mary in the Spirit knew what the future held and all its horrific glory for our Lord. As to the poor, Jesus had made a good point that there will always be poor. There will always be those with less than others that are going to need to be cared for. Perhaps even more importantly than many moderns would like, the fact that Jesus uses the word always implies that poverty and hard times this side of heaven, similar to war, will not go away until the end of history. Thus messianic promises from Washington, D.C. or the United Nations or NATO or the CDC or the World Health Organization or the World Economic Forum, when it's all said and done, any governing body worldwide that talks about stopping this problem or that problem, essentially they're just giving promises, mostly false. Consider, America tosses money all around the world, money to help Ukraine, while the people in Maui, Hawaii suffer. Money to help the border problem in the Middle East, but our own border is wide open and has been wide open. My own daughter is a combat medic in the United States Army, and she was on the border for seven months. And it was a joke as to the list of all the things that the U.S. Army could not do while guarding our border. Political promises are meaningless in the face of a sovereign God. And that's why these problems do not go away. Wake up, America. Submit to Christ now while you still have time. Back to our text. St. John also tells us that Judas was a crook. Now, did John know this at the time, at that very event, at Lazarus' house? Or is this John looking back, as it were, during the time he was writing this gospel. Probably so, because it's a parenthetical statement. Similar to our modern politicians who demand money in the name of helping the poor, yet we find out through their tax returns that they give nothing to the poor, and many times are caught with their hand in the cookie jar, Judas has been outed by St. John even prior to the betrayal showing once again that John will sometimes give clues to the character of the people he's exhibiting in his writing. Equally of interest is that Martha is serving and silent. First time she is on the scene and not spouting off. Evidently, and unlike Judas, Martha has learned something about how our Lord rules, how he takes care of business, how he does the work of his father who sent him. We next see in verse 9, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, 
they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Verse 10, so the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So again, um, it's at the time of the Passover. People are going through the purification rites. So you can be sure that the Pharisees are all over Jerusalem, making a list, checking it twice, find out who's naughty or nice as far as who is ritually pure. Did you wash your hands? Have you brushed your teeth? Have you done this? Have you done that? Right? And so we can, we can assume that someone representing them was at the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus when Jesus was there and had reported back. And of course, by this time, it was too far. It was a foregone conclusion. Not only does Jesus have to go, so does the evidence of Jesus' miracle-working ability have to go. Lazarus, he's got to go too. You know, it, it, it's like some special secret government operation where you have to clean up because it didn't go the way you wanted. So again, the dark robe lords are gathered just like witches at black masses, sorcerers of death construction. Back in Jerusalem, St. John stating the decision had been made by the Sanhedrin, death. Why? Well, as we know, they knew what the score was regarding the ministry of Christ. That's what was stated in earlier parts of chapter 11, right? They know what it means to their place within Israel, their ministry, and the fact that they were losing their place. As for the common people, they are beginning to realize that Jesus is the Messiah. In fact, some of the people in the Sanhedrin also had realized it, but as we'll see in the chapters to come, for fear of the Jews, they wouldn't declare themselves. Jesus asked for nothing but their trust in him. As for the Pharisees, they asked for a lot, endlessly, relentlessly, implacably, exhaustively. Thus people who have been oppressed by men whom Jesus himself called blind, fools blind, Wolves doing the work of their father, the devil. In other words, we look no further than at the spiritual reason for such phrases coming out of the mouth of our Lord. These were evil men driven by an evil spirit. They act the way they do because they cannot help themselves, as St. Paul noted in Romans 8, 7. A terrifying verse. Terrifying. Hear God's word, shudder, be afraid. Romans 8, verse 7. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Terrifying words. People driven by the dark spirit cannot but do dark things. Like moths, they are drawn over and over again to the warm, evil glow of temptation. They are fascinated by what draws them, and it becomes a madness within them. A madness of lust. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And they covet. And then, of course, do they take that step and cross over God's law and transgress? That's what sin is. It begins to fester in our hearts and minds until it clicks. And we commit an act of the will and surrender to its power. We see it clearly in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 4, when God rebukes Cain. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, and you must rule over it. We see it in the New Testament when the Spirit speaks through St. James, who in chapter 1 said, verse 13, 
Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And most pointedly of all, Christ speaks of it in Mark chapter 7 regarding the issues of the heart. Mark 7, beginning with verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Sin is the big disease with the little name, the enemy within the haunted house of our hearts. People who are not of the faith do not know that, yet they intrinsically know that something is wrong with them. They just don't know what to do about it. People who are of the faith know it lurks within. Yet, and yet, Similar to an actor in a horror movie who hears something in the basement and starts to go down, and the audience is watching and saying, don't go down there. Do not go down those stairs. Naturally, the light doesn't work. And the audience is saying, don't go down there. Well, many believers are similar to the audience. They do not go down in the dark basement of their hearts. And sin continues to seep up through the walls and keep their heart haunted, like a haunted house. The actress or actor in the movie has two choices, go down and see or shove the table against the door and refuse to go look, perhaps even run out of the haunted house. So likewise, the Christian who either deals with what's down in the dark place of their heart in the basement or not and live on the edge of Christendom. The Christian is truly seeking the Lord, knows that they must not only enter the haunted house of their heart. They must also move the table, unlock the door, and go down with the light of God's word and see what lurks below in that dark basement. Otherwise, what is in the basement will come out for all to see. And that which we see without is merely an outworking of what's going on within, within our hearts, right? Nothing has changed. It was true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament. It's true now. That which is within us comes out. Scripture makes that abundantly clear. Christ himself made it clear. Solomon in the Proverbs made it clear. Chapter 4, verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. As all four Gospels show us, it is always an issue of the heart that must be changed or else there is no hope. We must be born again, as Jesus told Nicodemus in chapter 3. We must call on the Lord and be saved, as the book of Acts tells us. We must cling to the Lord through Bible reading and prayer and ask God to renew our hearts and minds and conform us to the image of his Son, the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, the Messiah. We must be a disciple, meaning a seeker, a learner, who walks the path of light, just as Mary, when she sat down at Jesus' feet and listened. Are you listening? Are you a seeker after life? Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give on to us the increase of faith, hope, and charity, and that we may obtain that which thou dost promise. Make us to love which thou dost command through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.